Some pray for themselves, some pray for others. Between camera setups, I did a bit of both. And sometimes our prayers are answered, as these cast-offs testify. How else explain my landing one of the most coveted jobs in the BBC on the strength of spotty amateur movies like that? There was no pony anymore, but Elgar bought himself a bike, and despite all setbacks, almost certainly felt an enormous relief. That was the voice of Sir Hugh Weldon, who ran Monitor the first regular arts program ever to be seen on British television. I was taken on as the resident filmmaker and under Hugh's inspired guidance produced regular documentaries for 10 years or more, the most popular of which was undoubtedly Algar, man and boy. image that put him forever in the top ten and made Algar a household name. And I was the happiest chap in England. The viewers, it seems, were also happy, and so I was permitted to work my way through my favourite composers. Cut to graduation day at the Conservatory of Music in Old St. Petersburg, with the faculty divided over the merits of a new piano concerto by their star pupil, Sergei Prokofiev. A great performance on a low budget, with only enough cash to show the composer's hands miming to a record, and two professors playing 200. It's all done by mirrors, and dumb show. Making films for Monitor was fun, despite the restrictions which also included those of policy. Reconstructions were frowned upon at first, and although I was eventually permitted to have an actor impersonate Bartok, and in close-up at that, only his music was allowed to speak for him. That, and Hugh Weldon's commentary. Throughout the 20s and 30s, Bartok was steadily composing... Song of Summer! You can understand the ancient Persians worshipping the sun. Yes, Hugh finally gave the okay to get out the clapperboard. Maybe ancient he was getting sick of the sound of his own voice, who knows. But it was certainly a breakthrough when Delius, blind and paralyzed, was allowed to converse with his amanuensis, Eric Fenby. Now then, Fenby, where were we from yesterday? Cellos and basses. Yes, I, th I think it should be an A, cellos and basses. Very good. Now, in our parts, uh, get your violins a C sharp. Yes, 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 play it. And yes, uh, violas. What have you got in the violas? Well, well I've nothing there. Oh, well, better get a B flat there. Yes, yes, and play it like that. Yes, just a little excitement. Uh, now, John, play it all. Yes, now take your C-sharp to E, second violins. Yes, that's it. Against F-sharp and A, next bar, first violins. Uh, put a G there. Where does the G go? Divide your cellos. G in the first part. Yes, uh, low A in the second. Yes, uh, yes, uh, add a bassoon there. Oh, write that down. Well, shouldn't the bass move a little bit, really? No, 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 no. Uh, put, put a pizzicato on the first beat. Uh, no, better on the third beat. Yes, now move your inner parts down a semitone. Bring the oboe in. Top A. Ta 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 ta. Triplet on the first beat. <laughs> yes, now play it all. Fuck up the pizzicato yes, in the bases. Yes, yes. That's it, Eric. But not all of my BBC biopics were straightforward as that award winner. And at the time, the Debussy film was considered quite controversial. What's all this got to do with Debussy? He wrote the music for a mystery play called The Martyrdom of Saint Sebastian. That's when a Saint Sebastian been a woman. Gabriel D'Annunzio wrote it for a woman. Don't ask me why. I'm just being faithful to the author's concept. Mr. Russell, why do you deliberately set out to shock your audience? I believe in mass therapy. <laughs> why is preoccupation, I could almost say reverence for art? What does the word art mean to you? A white stick tapping through the night. <laughs> I see. 
You virtually invented the drama documentary and you've had many imitators. The genre is now exhausted. What next? Satire! I found the perfect subject in Richard Strauss, who wrote an overblown domestic symphony in which he set his family life to music. Someone called the piece a cataclysm of domestic plumbing, but Strauss didn't stop at bathroom humour. Most of the symphony takes place in the bedroom, for which he composed Eine Kleine Nuki Musik, and laid bare his more intimate moments with a candour hitherto unknown in music. Thus spake the great lover. This is not the music of Richard Strauss. I must protest. No, it's by his old mate Johann. Won't that do? Nonsense, he's made his Josephine in bed there. Uh, now wait a minute and I'll explain. When Strauss Jr. saw the original program, he was so outraged that he slapped an embargo on the music. But he couldn't touch the picture, so it's okay to keep watching. May I ask you a question? Certainly. Mr. Russ, are you a sex maniac? No, but Strauss was. Is what we have just seen an example of pop art? Well, since it deflated a bloated ego, I'd call it pop tart. <laughs> Some might call it infantile. Only the senile. Mr. Russell, you are deliberately deceiving the public. We had Strauss did not have a symphony orchestra in the bedroom. Oh, but he did. <coughs> oh, really? <laughs> there. In there. <laughs> you have made sport with the truth. Strauss wore a nightcap in bed. True or false? That's not important. So what is? You obviously enjoy your role of Enfant Terrible of the British cinema. Is that how they see me? Yeah! Oh. <laughs> and all because I was a little unconventional and irreverent. So why the fuss? Why the outrage? The Dance of the Seven Veils was simply a satirical look at Richard Strauss stripped down to his swastika. By exposing his activities in Nazi Germany and the sex and violence in his music, it seems I was guilty of attacking a sacred cow. The result was an international scandal. The BBC were less than pleased. After 34 films, it was a fast fade out. No golden handshake. No handshake at all. The feature film world is pretty free with its handshakes. But mention the word art and they think you mean Art Garfunkel. Tchaikovsky? What film on a composer ever made money? Tell me. What's the storyline? Well, it's about a homosexual who falls in love with a nymphomaniac. Sometimes it could be as simple as that. But my next sales pitch, struggling artist shares studio with woman twice his age in platonic relationship. Cuts no ice with the distributors. Can't think why. So I had to double mortgage my house in order to finance Savage Messiah. I was glad to. I owed a debt to its hero, Henri Gaudier. Brescia. Gaudier was artisan as well as artist. Often on the verge of starvation, he turned his hand to anything to earn a crust for himself and his beloved Mamalushka, and enjoyed the challenge. And though his genius was never appreciated in his own lifetime, he was always aware of his own talent. And that alone was enough to keep him going. Alphabet Soup kept me going when I was down and out with only dreams of becoming a film director. Soup and the stirring example of Gaudier's belief that everything in life is worth enduring for the sake of one thing only. That and the love of a woman you gladly die for. By now I had the reputation of being as reckless as Godia and was regarded with suspicion by members of the establishment. Women in Love was admired, but almost everything after that aroused passions as varied as the films themselves, especially the religious subjects. She's 
got the power to heal you. Never fear her. She has got the power to heal you. Never fear. Just one word from her lips, and the deaf can hear. Hey, she's got the power to heal you. Never fear. And the deaf can hear <laughs> yeah. Marilyn Monroe, Saint Marilyn, from Tommy, the boy who toppled false gods in his search for enlightenment. <laughs> I too was disillusioned. I wanted to break free. I was tired of clouds of incense. I was after clouds of glory. Mountain, God made manifest according to the poet Coleridge. It was here, in the most beautiful place in England, that I found my new church. The west wing of the transept is Catbells, the most walked upon hill in Cumbria, while the east wing is known as Grange Fell and is frequented mostly by rock climbers and sheep. The nave is Borrowdale Valley and the altar is Castle Crag, where a memorial stands to local lads killed in the war. The font is Derwent Water, and my new prayer book, The Prelude, by William Wordsworth. And so, in a sense, I became a devout churchgoer, encouraging congregations of film crews to share my devotions. One of my favourite locations was the Low Door Fall, but you could point a camera most anywhere up here and come up with a spectacular shot. It's a place of enchantment that can transform itself into Norway, Switzerland, or Bavaria at the sound of a clapperboard. Or even the kitsch, never-never world of Zarathustra in pursuit of life. <laughs> 